G'day. Well, I've finally made it to Sapphire in central Queensland. And I'm going to do myself some digging to find me that special gem. Now, here at the Big Bessie Foster King Park, the wash level is pretty shallow. It's only about a foot deep, as you can see here, in the wall along here. Now, I'm trying to find the gravel in this. Now, the gravel's only about that deep here. But there's plenty of signs of ironstone, which is a good indicator there could be some sapphires and some zircons. Let's have a look. Right, I've got enough down. I'll put it in the bucket, take it over the sieve and see what happens. Now this stuff's pretty dirty. This stuff's pretty dirty. So you're gonna have to crunch it up and rub it in. This is a shaker, dry shaker. It gets all the dirt out, leave all the stones behind, hopefully. There's clumps like that you've got to go through because you don't know what's stuck in there. So rub as much as you can. Get it through the sieve. Pop the top off. Do the same at the bottom. Right, now I'm going to put the top back on and put it in the willoughby. This is a great machine. It saves you a lot of hard work on your back and with the dry sieve. Okay, now we've got it in the willoughby. I'm just gonna put it on the water a little bit and wash some of this mud off. Okay, now we'll do some pulsing action. This puts all the heavy material in the center. Isn't this much easier? See, that's how much is gone. All that's been washed off, so there wasn't much gravel in there. Okay, we'll take it out of here. There's not much gravel as you can see. Most of the dirt's been washed away, so it was probably more dirt than gravel. What I might do, and that's the concentrate on the bottom, what I'm gonna do is refill it and do it all again, so we've got enough there to work with. Now, I'm just gonna give the smaller sieve a bit of a wash. You can see that action happening in the center there. See all that pulsating in the center? That's pulling everything into the center. All the heavy material. Okay, I think that'll be ready to go. Okay, let's see what we got. Hmm, there's a lot of ironstone there. Ooh, what is that? Oh, that's that planus. It looks like a sapphire. Very dark. What a pity. Anyway, oh, there's a little green one. Tiny little green one there. No, no. Nice and clear. Uh, we've got a little green sapphire here. A little tiny one. Oh, there's a, a bluey. What else we got? There's another one, but it's a bit fractured, this one. Can use a divining rod like this, Al. Now, looking for a 15 carat stone in the depth. One, two, three, four, five. Five feet down, 15 carats. How do you know it's 15 carats, mate? A metal picture uh, in my head. So that I've got that size and that sapphire 
nothing else, just sapphire. That's all I'm looking for. Come down here, Alan, and I'll show you where I've been finding them. Excellent. I found most of my good sapphires along this layer here. As you can see, you've got a red layer, then you've got a top layer. This top layer is good to watch. See the billy boulders? Where the billy boulders lay, you got pockets and divots, which that's where, where very gravelly and good chance of you finding sapphires, but your best is going to be along here. In this coloured wash. As you can see, it's a lot more pebblier, a lot more grainier. In the floods, this is your, your last form where it all settles. This is this is your bottom where it, it's hardly been touched. So you're bound to find your best down the bottom here. The mustard iron is the stuff that you've got to look for because more mustard iron, better your chance of finding your sapphire. This morning I found a nice one along here. These clumps. Oh look, there's one. Oh look at that. So it's just like in the clay there mate. Just sitting in the clay. Oh look at that. Another green for the morning. Yeah, that's not too bad, is it? Well done, Link. So how many of these things you've actually got out of this hole? Oh, I've got a biggest biggest one is 47.2 carat, nice green. The colour nice stone. Oh, that would be beautiful. Uh, that was a buzz, it was just in the wall. You could just see it sitting in the wall as I picked away. It takes a while for you to get your eye in though. How long has it taken you to dig all this out, Link? Four months, but as you can see, I've been having troubles with the rain lately, so I've had to build myself a dam wall to block all the water out. And as you can see, your boots just get full of mud, doesn't matter what you do, you end up muddy as hell. How'd you go on the last rain here? Fill up? It filled right up to the top. So you've had to bucket it all out? dig it all out and dig myself a nice big damn wall to stop the water from getting in and as you can see it didn't real work real well but at least you can still get down there and start chipping at the sides there anyway mate right? why are you here Mick? well I just live over at Graves Hill and I come to Big Bessie because I'm always finding stones here doesn't matter where you look this is what you'll find these are just all around the place doesn't matter where you find where you look you'll find stone but this one, I'll show you one I found three weeks ago. These will go back in the container. <laughs> when I let, seen this one on the road, I let go of the bike, it had no brakes, so I just jumped off. And that was just sparkling at me. This is why I keep coming here, you find stones like this. This was just up on Big Bessie Road. And, oh, Mount Bullock Road it is, sorry. And, it cut to a 4.1 from a 13.8 and I just jumped off the push bike that was laying right in the middle of the road. That's I had incredible. no brakes on the bike so I jumped off and grabbed it. No, 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 that's all I have. So. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. 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 How long have you been doing it for? I, can't, I cannot believe your postage charge is 25 bucks. They're all from. They're done them a while ago, and that was the price of the other stage, so we're not going to see that. Well, I still call back, I killed the guy on the bakery, so I'll charge the four bucks a time. Where's the stuff going? Here is the centre of a boulder. You see how that goes around there? And it goes right around 360 degrees. Right, you see these lines here? Yep. When they split open, there could be good colour in those lines. Right? So when she came out the ground, this part of the boulder was dead, but there's a lot of opal in that. And that's why they call it boulder opal, because it forms in that ironstone. Was it dug out by a machine? Or? That one was dug out by a machine, yeah. 40 foot. Beautiful. But look at the colour. Stone after stone after stone. And then they slab it up into these big slabs, like that, see? You see all the opal in there? Look at that. 
line after line after line after line of colour. So the cutter will cut those lines out, open them up, gemstone after gemstone. And that's how they do it. Wow. Amazing, eh? Hey? Cut, cut, cut that out. It's G-rated, mate. It's G-rated. My heart's end. <laughs> It's definitely G-rated. Uh, it's the noddies to go with the long shot, please, Butter. Oh, no. Well, how about we take a wet and a thing down? Yeah, that'll yeah. do. Yeah? yeah. That's it. There's some colour up on it. Some colour here. Red down in there. That's beautiful. Brush or something, we tried getting a wire brush to rub all that off, but it's like concrete, yeah, it's yeah. can't shift it. There's a good chance there'll be some nice clean stuff in here, wouldn't there? Well, yep, yeah, just on that. Uh, just leave it, specimen. Like I said, I'll get a, a, a five foot of nine inch drill aug auger, chrome plate it, polish it, I'll get a stand made for it, and off the auger, a couple of braces, so this would be suspended round yeah. the auger, wow. sell it to a drilling company. Wow, yeah. But you polish this up, or just leave it completely glass no, it is? I would polish the, in the individual nuts. I would only polish the nuts, try and leave the sandstone natural, and just polish the nuts. Is That's all right, it doesn't matter if it spills. It's colour. Right through here as well. Oh yeah. And then you see here. Once you scrub all that, you know, you polish each individual nut, you know, that'll come up magic. That's beautiful up there, isn't it? Yeah. Oh god, yeah, that's the stuff. That's the stuff I'm after. So you know you can imagine a, a chrome auger down through there, beautiful. this suspended off the side of it in the foyer of some drilling company. Oh look, yeah, definitely. I, ha I had a piece years ago and I sold to a bloke here. I gave him the idea. Um, first of all, I'm just gonna pick some names. Guy Walter, Mark Moore, and Eddie the Opal Hunter. Um, basic idea is, just got to wind, and the finish line is here. It's the first um, sled over the finish line wins. Uh, the winner from those events goes through to other heats and possibly the finals. Um, there's gloves to wear if you want, and um, basically good luck.
Okay, yeah, I'm just going down here. It's only three metres down to the bottom. When I get down there, I'll give you a hoy and just come down. So one on the ladder at a time. Put on your feet. Okay. Coming down. You can see down on the bottom here, see the granite, just the decomposed granite at the bottom, and then it drops away down into the bottom left hand corner. Just a few little rocks, and a lot of the gravel is very small, so that'll usually give you small ironstone and tiny little remnant sapphires, but not very many big ones. And you can see as the layers get further up, that's probably from lots of floods, or maybe a lot of flows in, in one big flood event. But you can see up on top here there's another layer of um, the calcified gravel and sand. See that hard layer? And I like to see this hard layer runs right across the top of here. That's always a good indication to be working underneath this. But one of the best places to work that I've worked all over the years and found quite common with patches of sapphires, if you get a layer of fine sand or mud coming down to a concentrated band of wash onto the floor. And if that band of wash runs from a foot to two foot thick, with a fine silt layer over the top of it, it showed it's a place in the riverbed where it's been scoured out while the main flood's going, and then it's filled up with silt in that later. So, you know, when you're panning for, for gold in a dish and you sloshed it around and you got all your heavies get caught up in one place. Well, that's the way I see these little pinch outs or thin layers of wash, I see is the tail of a dish. When you get out further and go to the left and go out and the gravel layers get bigger and thicker and sometimes six feet of wash, there's never as many sapphires in that as what there is in the, in the concentrated beds. Now we, we discuss all sorts of theories about how the sapphires got here, um, blasted out onto the edges of the hillsides behind us just from the volcanic peak, only three k's up the road. Maybe big floods came and brought all the volcanic ash and rock down into this riverbed and deposited the sapphires and concentrated them into certain areas. Not all areas in the same run or the same riverbed carry the same concentration. So that tells me that the water and the flow of the river has actually concentrated the sapphires because they're slightly, they're slightly heavier than the rest of the gravel. So the sapphires and ironstone and zircons all end up much more concentrated in these little thin patches of wash. Would that be sort of like a becoming like an eddy? It just sort of like it's being pushed up into a little eddy well, on the side? Well, I see it as a few different things. If you see, let's see how the floor is up and down. And you can imagine the riverbed flowing and carrying all those rocks. Well, there's always a wave action and it bounces up and down. At the peak of a wave and the peak of a bank, the, 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 the wave is going to lose its energy and the heavy stuff lags behind and the light stuff just keeps on going. So you can see that quite often. It's like I can, you nearly instinctively see when you've gone off stone. Just as the same when you think you're coming onto a patch of stone like we are in front here. There's nice basalts and rocks and a concentration. And, and I know from experience in this area that that can carry good sapphires. Whereas I can look to the left end here and say, I'm not going on that direction anymore. I'm just wasting my time. And, and I've proved it by digging it. So there's, even though you think you've worked out all the theories, the, the sapphires are where you find them. Um, I've worked and found some of the best patches really high up on top of the banks, re really high up, and I see that as that wave action. Or if you imagine that this whole lot in the first catastrophic floods with um, two or 300 inches a year rainfall when this part of Queensland was down in the middle of Victoria when, you know, 50 million years ago, major floods come, all this volcanic ash and rock and everything got washed down into the riverbed and just left the heavy deposits 
up, up high on the banks, and then later riverbeds came in, scared out the easy stuff in the, in, in, in the deeper channels. And sometimes in a major flood, everything in the channel has been moved. And maybe the lagging behind and getting these clay areas with rocks and sapphires in them up on the top is because that's resisted the flow of the, the, the next flood after it's all dried out. And that's how come riverbeds meander. They just take the easiest path. And so they'll move further and further, cut out the floor where it's softer. And these remnant patches have been left. We're now 10 metres underground. Whereas this comes out to the surface in Policeman's Creek, um, 400 metres away. It's just a sandy little creek with all this light, sort of fluffy okay. sand and that in it. But I have seen reworked patches right on that creek, on the edge of that creek, which have been a similar grey wash with the nice yellowy brown ironstone and, and rounded slimy sort of rocks and that in it so it's amazing how quickly it can change and how areas right across a, a, a three or four k region actually this riverbed of a part of um bedford hill is nearly a kilometre or so wide and we're only five kilometres from where it narrows right down to less than a hundred metres wide and, and only little tiny channels in the granite that and yet okay. five kilometres up the road and go down past Rubyvale um, into the Rush or the Rice Bowl and places where Retreat Creek and Policeman's Creek join together it could be nearly two kilometres wide in places okay. down there but they'll still find the sapphires in these runs where the heavier wash, you know, deposits of the, the, the heavy material. So you need rocks, you need it to be concentrated, um, and you need to see the ironstone and the little sapphires and obviously the rubbish and that sort of thing. But when I hear the rig working up on top, on top, rumbling around like a tune, you know, the big rocks and that rumbling around and the more rocks, the better the chance there are of sapphires in the pole so at the end of the day. Rocks and, and, the, and sapphires and don't sapphires, all go together. They come together, you know. If you're going to get them pure sand or really light gravelly sand like that, you're not going to get that much. You get little stuff. Now we're going to do some digging. This will be good. gradually went down there, the granite being right there. That went down to the northwest, which is the direction that the river basically flowed from the northwest to the southeast. If we're on the top of the bank and slightly going down there, that's going to be the best collection. The, 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 the slope that goes from the top of this bank down to the southeast, which was the downhill slope, is not going to carry the same sapphires. And that 
that's with that interior, the, 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 the heavy stuff being lagged behind it out right now. Push them over the top. Yeah. Okay, so that's the front end of the car. Like I said before though, when you're on stone and, and you've figured out a patch that's paying really well and you're getting tons of sapphires, you reckon that you're the smartest person in the world, you've worked it all out and you know, how can you not make a living out of sapphire mining? But that stops, that they never last forever. Yeah, it's never just a forever. pocket, isn't it? And it's exactly the same when you're off stone and you're digging. You could say, I could be digging anywhere. I could be digging in the garden and get more sapphires than this. What am I doing? Yeah. You know, so yeah. just sometimes you can get through the last I can imagine. And, and it's interesting, a, a, lot, a lot of newcomers actually, beginner's luck, you know, they put the first hole down get a really fantastic place and they get spoiled and um, and then and disillusion them when they go off stone and sort of lose interest probably uh, after working here for 35 years and working in the area and under, underground mining for you know, 30 odd years you just get used to that business of sometimes you make money sometimes you're just working for nothing you know? but it's that same old thing that Tomorrow, it'll be better tomorrow, you know, I'll be, oh, I'm going to get the big one or a nice one. You never, the very next day. So you never know, do you? Have one more dig. So that's shaping up to be the right type of wire. We can probably have a look close to look over there and see if there's any concerts break out. It would be nice. Titanic iron, it's very metallic looking. Ilmenite, that's the stuff yeah. we're looking at. It's upstairs, isn't it? On the and ground then upstairs. There's, um, and then this this black stuff, I don't know whether it comes in, um, in, in with the basalts or this is the decomposed basalt. Oh, you can see those grey okay, ones yeah, there. Yeah. And then the billy boulders are these rounded ones. Yeah. Um, and then you've got lots of flat bits of quartz and of course you've got your reddish coloured ones and your ironstone and that, you know. Well, there's all sorts of theories that the sapphires actually came in the basalts and I've never broken a basalt open with a sapphire. and found sapphires. I've actually found little bits of peridol or what they call olivine, you know, the, 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 green. the, the, the little green bits and that is in, in it. No, just a bit of black quartz. Oh. Identify the same stuff, and there's little tiny bits of concentrate there, and lots of iron stones here, all in here. Yeah. Lots of yellow in there. Well, just underneath the drop. Not a lot of definition between the wash and the floor. Yes, that's the floor, that's six yeah. decomposed granite.
jumped over onto this grizzly down here. rates to get the rocks and that to fall off yeah. and then the conveyor goes through gets fed over the conveyor and then down through to the trommel which takes out all the fine sand so you can be a fine big sand heap there all the gravel that fits through that mesh at the far end which is 40 millimeters goes down and gets washed through the pulsator and any of the bigger gravel oversized goes straight out the other end so at the end of the day I come up and just clean out the sapphires out of that pulsator. That must be the best part of the day. <laughs> oh it is, especially if you put a lot of dirt through and I mean a big day for me mining using that digger and bogger and that is sometimes up to 40 of those buckets which is probably close to 18 to 20 cubic meters of dirt in a day so if you've been on a good patch and put that much dirt through you know you're going to get a nice hand from the sapphires. be in these first couple of trays. See here's the light gravel on top. You can see some of the see the heavy iron fan going up in here. No, just a longest broken one, a green one. There's another one here. So you see what they look like? It's very obvious in the pulsator. Oh, oh yeah. There's yeah. another one. Hang on. Get in close. Have to, I have to turn it around and get the sun shining through it. Yeah. I can do that. I'll just get what's in here and put them in my hand. Yeah, and then we can put them in the sun. see the different colors here this place is quite famous for its um there's a nice one mm, not that good uh, famous for its green ones and party color ones not just the deep blues most of the blues we get are very very dark there's one there One, 
ici. Here's a dog's tooth one. None of them are really brilliant. A little blue one there. It might be ideal. Very if you green, can, aren't they? Can you get that colour? A lot of them are fairly green, yeah. That one's blue and yellow, so it's showing that that one's actually got a bit of blue party through it. Yeah. Skinny piece of bluey green piece there with a blue bit of party. No, not a lot. And that one there, like a long one. It's got some cracks in it, you can see. Well, that's typically what they look like. There's the one's got a bit of blue and a bit of... Rat's got a nice blue. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, hey, your mining operation seems a little bit old fashioned. Why is that? The reason we mine the way we do now, it's not so much a matter of wanting to stick with the old ways, but sometimes the old ways were better in a way. In that the more technology we add, the more machinery we add, the more our costs go up. What we've done, which the old miners did, was dig very small tunnels because the sapphires are very heavy. If you have a sapphire in one hand and a rock even of greater size in the other hand, the sapphire weighs a lot more. So when this flowed as an alluvial flow, there's more sapphires generally at the bottom of the layer than at the top of the layer. Now, if the layer's three metres thick, which is what we've got down there, we get sapphires at the top, middle, bottom. If we just take the bottom, we will get more sapphires per yard of dirt. So then we, our, we don't need to process as much, which keeps the fuel cost down on your processing if you were using machinery, but we don't need to use machinery because we're not processing three metres to move in height as we're moving forward we're only processing well sometimes our tunnels are the height of this bucket here for instance which is getting a little bit difficult because you're working down on your elbows so to speak as in right down um, if you can imagine me down the tunnel like this and the height of the tunnel is there so that gives you a little bit of a clue how low some of the tunnels are generally a little bit higher than that where I can sit up just like this working. So about this sort of height is our tunnel working height. So you're crawling. And that way you get a big percentage per yard of sapphires. We move the stuff down the tunnels just with buckets. Very basic. No, no machinery down there whatsoever. We do use a jackhammer these days. So a little... <laughs> we've moved into the 20th century maybe. Um, we move it back to the shaft, so we're in a tunnel, we move it back to the shaft, stack up the buckets, and then come up the ladder, and then we actually hook the buckets from the top. Um, unless my wife's helping me, I will actually come up and hook them myself using a three-pronged hook, which was the old way, and the windlass we use is the old way, there's no machine to operate it, it has a ratchet on it so you can't hurt yourself, hook the bucket, wind it up, and all you're using is this, and you're not putting fuel in the machine because say you hit a bad patch of ground you're still going to be processing all that dirt so if you're using a machine to bring it up that's one lot of fuel if you're using another machine to take the dry dirt out that's another lot of fuel and a machine to wash it that's a lot of fuel and a lot of water and usually this is dry country water becomes critical the way we do it we're not bringing so much dirt up so therefore we don't use so much fuel or so much water um, from there we actually still wash by hand um, in just a big sieve not as fast as a machine nowhere near as fast but it's actually more efficient because we don't miss anything in that all the heavy stuff drops to a pocket in the bottom of the big sieve and we just do that by hand still do it very quickly um, it's just a, a little bit of a process that's all and again physically it's probably a little bit more demanding but when you hit a bad patch you're not wasting fuel so it's your costs are way, way down. Um, and 
my wife Debbie does all the cutting and we've basically tried to aim for a niche market we can't compete with a major operation where they might have 10 people cutting or they might be cutting them overseas because they're going for the volume we go for the best of the best the quality. Say, the quality the quality yes the quality so to improve the quality normally a standard sapphire cut would have 56 sides on the table or facets is the correct term she puts 72 sides on them um, those extra facets are around the point of the stone and with a sapphire you rely on the light going into the stone refracting coming back out and that gives you your brilliance the more sides you have naturally the more light refraction you get the neater you are and she's the neatest person in the world um, <laughs> she's fastidious um, the better the light refraction um, and so we aim for that little bit of a niche market there where people are looking for something special and she cuts for the public the same way as she cuts ours so her reputation precedes it to say the least um, excellent hmm. Peter doing it by hand down the down the tunnels and that how much dirt would you move in a day okay when we're working in the tunnels we if we're not getting interrupted because we're obviously running tourist business as well yep. so sometimes you might go down there and you might only dig one bucket of dirt and then you've got 50 foot or ladder to climb up because someone wanted you up here but if you were staying down there continuously we could move say a cubic meter in in, in those terms or move forward a meter um, to even more sometimes it just depends on the day at the moment we've we have difficulties down there because we had floods here in 2008 that washed away all our mine shafts it doesn't wash away the tunnel system but washed away the mine shafts the tunnel system very like concrete that's made our working just environment just a little bit harder than usual um, because the aquifer in the area the water that's under the ground has actually risen and so before we work we actually have to pump the water out and you can't quite get all the water out and it is actually running in around you which in effect is actually good we don't have extra machinery down there because if we had electricity running in there we wouldn't be able to work it would just be impossible there's too much water so we, we actually use an air jackhammer not an electric jackhammer so we have no problems with and a light on the hard hat and that's it which is a little bit of a rough work environment I suppose in some ways because you're in the mud the water and the snakes go down there to eat the frogs as well so that can get a little bit daunting sometimes because if you're in a tunnel this high and there's a oh, King Brown in there with oh, you no. he can stand up to roof height oh, with no. you in there and if he's come down after you've gone in there and you're in a dead-end tunnel then you have to actually try to ask him to leave in a nice manner um, how do you turn and run in a little tiny little tunnel like that? No, you don't. No, you so don't. it's it's head to head. It's yeah, it can be head serpent to head. himself. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you won't catch me doing that, Pete. The worst we've had since the 2008 floods, because before then we actually had hand dug holes. Well, we had drill holes, and we had a couple of holes we dug 45 footers or 15 meters, where we dug them pick and shovel, and sounds bizarre but at least with the pick and shovel holes you can dig a bigger hole which means from the mining this way the ideal thing is to go down there and dig 20 30 40 buckets stack them all up and if you have no one to wind up for you we partners too busy then you can come up and wind up 20 buckets since then we've had to put drill holes in which are only um, under three feet 0.9 of a meter round about so you can't stack a lot of buckets down there okay when we first drilled the first drill hole after the 2008 floods and the following week I went down the water had risen when you drilled it dry next morning water lots of water when we <coughs> um, went down that first time I actually didn't know how much water you couldn't see because we'd lowered the ladder but not right to the floor the drill couldn't get right to the bottom we had to actually jackhammer the last part down through the rocks Unfortunately, as I went to step off the ladder, a brown snake went between my legs oh. and back again in the water, which you can't actually grab them very well in the water. They're really hard to see, a brown snake in brown, murky water. 
Um, so, yeah, I don't like them down there with me, I'm afraid. They have to come up and leave. They go. It's natural for them to go there, of course. They, they go down to eat the green frogs. Frogs, in, in, from time to time, will go to a hole in the ground and they could stay down there for months sometimes. And snakes live in a hole in the ground, so um, they go down there as well. And the snakes go up and down the ladder, along with the frogs coming up and down the ladder. So sometimes you're going down and they're coming up. Oh. Um, oh. Which can be a little bit daunting, because <laughs> if you picture yourself standing on a ladder, like so, and if you've got your foot here on a run, the next run is there. If the snake's on the one below there, um, just just do it on a ladder one day and actually try and hold here and reach the rung below that foot to get the snake off the ladder. Uh, mate, I'll be just the next tap up and up and up and out of there to leave the snake there. <laughs> uh, you can't leave them there because the longer you leave them there, the more they turn it into home. Oh. And the, if they if they say we went down the mine right now, if the snake had been down there just for a few hours, it's much less of a problem than if he's been down there, say say we left a hole sit there for months, then the snake could have made it home, laid its eggs, and then you've got a real problem because they will defend that territory. If so have you ever been bitten? No. 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 no, they're browns, and to get bitten down there could be a little bit of an issue because um, obviously your heart rate's pumping anyhow if, if you're facing a snake in a tunnel mm -hmm. that's this high. Um, and even if you put a compression bandage on it, that's certainly going to... We, we know how to treat a snake bite, but you've got 50 foot of ladder to climb up. Normally your heart rate is pumping coming up there. You get low oxygen levels in there sometimes as well, which increases your heart rate, um, particularly after the 2008 floods, because we only had one hole to start with and then another one over there, which you had to join together. And because we tunnel small, you actually, when you're working, you use up the oxygen. So you have to be very careful you're bringing out carbon dioxide onto the floor, it's heavy gas, it sits on the floor, so that affects your work environment as well, so you, you have to be cautious of that. So if you get bitten by a snake, the, the last thing you actually want to do is run up that ladder because it's going to pump it straight through your system. So, no, I'm never getting bitten by a snake and I definitely have a guardian angel. Because <laughs> you can't get in a drill hole, and now you've got to picture a, a drill hole, 0 0.9 of a metre. That's about there. Um, and you've got a ladder in there, we had a, a vent pipe we'd lowered down into there and a bucket we'd, we'd lowered down. So you have this at your feet, you have that much around you, you've got a ladder that you actually got one foot on, your shoulders are almost touching the other wall and the snake is swimming around here. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, Needless to say, person. I did say a few words that day which Debbie could actually hear from the bottom of the ladder to the cutting room with the door closed. She heard every word as I came up that ladder because uh -huh. I was not a very happy little Vegemite. <laughs> mm. And he was biting the bucket. That's what's You're amazing. You're kidding! No, w when we brought him up, we scooped him in a bucket. Um, and he was actually going whack on the side of the bucket because we'd interrupted lunch. He was down there trying... The frogs are swimming around in the water. He's a no easy target because... Usually in the tunnels, what happens is the frogs will get on our buckets and the snake can't get them. We always usually know when we get down there, if, if the, this is when we haven't got water in the tunnels, you have buckets sitting there. If the frogs are all sitting up on the buckets, start looking very carefully because the snake's been in there or he's still in there. Um, and you can smell them when they're there. They, they have a certain smell. Hmm. Not a nice smell. Um, That's better. Don't smile. Look serious. <laughs> That's good. She's right. New boxes will make her use it. Yeah. There, so just give her one minute. Yeah. yeah it's good. That should just about, it might be too bright, but we'll see. Come around, Debs. Yeah, there. Find it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right.
sapphire is not just famous for sapphires. It also produces the VJ faceting machine, used by the most discerning faceters all around the world. Great. So that's, that's the part we started with. That's where we've gone to now for the preparation work. The previously machined part, we put the dock in like so. And that's where we put our stone on the end of that dock. Smile. <laughs> this is our the flagship of our uh, machines, if you like to call it that. Uh, the top of the range. Uh, the latest VJ machine off the assembly line. Uh, they have a three phase motor on the back. Very, very quiet and extremely high torque at low revs. Fantastic setup. Quite a good selection from 3mm up to 6mm.